Hello, Dr. Mike. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Sorry, I'm just waiting to see if we've, we've got everyone or if this is it. I don't want to have anyone left behind. Um, all right. <clears throat> So, Michael, are you good to go? I think so, yeah. If, we, if we're done waiting for people, I'm happy to start. I just want to make sure um, we weren't missing anyone well, that was coming in or... what? Why don't we do this? Um, I'll just do a little intro and, um, and, and do a couple things. So, folks, welcome uh, to this evening's Augustine uh, Lecture Series. This is our third, which is hard to believe. Um, these have gone by this fast. Um, Michael uh, is our guest, uh, Doc Mike. And I wanted to kind of show you, you know, his bio. Um, and um, so I'm just gonna try to do that real quick. And if I did this right, his is here. And what's been real cool here uh, to learn as I learn about this is uh, the interest in fountain pens, World War I, memorabilia and antique watches. I did not put that in your bio, Michael. Uh, and I thought that was kind of cool. It, it explains something I saw yesterday. Um, and so someday we'll talk about, you know, antique fountain pens and their merits. So, um, but we are really uh, got a great opportunity tonight with these lectures. The Augustine Society is a uh, organization that's been around since the mid 1950s. And we uh, specialize in heritage genealogy, um, history, chivalry, and one other one that'll come to me. And, and those are our kind of our areas of focus. We're a small group, we used to be very, very much larger. And this lecture series is a, an outreach approach to, for the society. There's a group of members I think who are on tonight or a few of us, and uh, anybody can be a member. And I, I would encourage if this is of interest to you uh, to join and take a look at that. Um, and you can find us very simply at augustinsociety.org and well in theory and and it's you know that'll tell you everything you ever want to know about the society um and we're actually working on a special project with a group of folks that have been our presenters here uh about this and we're hoping uh that that special edition of our augustium will come out in the fall now as a heads up in august we have one other person coming uh, Jonathan Query will be doing a presentation, and here it is, Augustan Art and Architecture, the Reorganization of Provincial Places, and that'll be on August 9th, so a month from tonight. Again, free. Uh, these are being sponsored by a member of the Society, and uh, we really appreciate that. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and Doc, you're on. All right. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. I'll try and share my screen. It's been a while since I've, I've, I've been the person leading a, a Zoom um, with the end of the term. So, oh, looks like I cannot share my screen. Um, Rod, I think you'll have to enable participant screen sharing, apparently. Let's see. There we go. Michael, right. I think you're good now. Perfect. Okay, so uh, I'm an epigrapher by training and part of it was, um, I was originally a Roman military historian and when I applied to do my doctorate role Holloway, uh, my, at that time, prospective supervisor had said, well, as awesome as military history is and as a military historian himself, he mentioned that we did want me to be a bit more broad so that I could potentially get a job somewhere in academia. So. In addition to being a Roman military historian, um, I was trained as an epigrapher, and that's someone who works with inscriptions. Uh, so most of my life, you know, has been spent looking at dead people. Um, I know it's become a sort of joke these days, but uh, whenever I watch The Sixth Sense and the little kid says, I see dead people, I, I usually think, yeah, so what? Uh, that's essentially a historian's career. So in addition to seeing them, I actually have come to think of a lot of dead people as my friends, uh, as strange as that might seem. Uh, when I trained, my supervisor did mention that you start looking at these inscriptions, you start looking especially at funerary inscriptions, and you get a sense of, of people. So most of my work on the urban cohorts uh, as part of the Rome garrison during the empire is actually epigraphic. 
lots of inscriptions from military discharge rosters to the individual tombstones of soldiers uh, commemorating their wives, for example, or commemorating, very sadly, uh, dead children. Uh, we have some cases of women commemorating their dead sister, uh, a sister in one case commemorates her dead brothers, both soldiers and her dead son, who uh, one presumes was about to join the army, uh, given the sort of family connections there. So it gives you the sense of humanizing what is at best, uh, a good way to put it, at best faceless soldiers, especially since modern media, uh, things like the History Channel, for example, don't tend to do the Roman army or really most things justice. Um, if you ever watched anything on the Spartans on the History Channel, you get a very one-dimensional picture of them, much as the Roman army, which is sort of portrayed as a non-thinking machine that just sort of rotates, moves, and, and butchers. And there's a lot more nuance to that. And I think when we look at the inscriptions, when we look at all this stuff, we'll see all that. Um, and hopefully one day I'll finish writing the book and maybe I'll con some of you into buying the book. But um, until then, this is all we've got. So the sources. Well, the urban cohorts are literally a military unit. And my doctoral thesis was a unit history spanning from around 13 CE to 312 CE. And that's essentially the timeline, about three centuries worth of military existence. Now we do have a variety of sources for the urban cohorts. Uh, in Latin, the cohortes urbani. Um, we do have literary sources. We have some sort of, well, I would say the sources are sparse at best. We do have some, some letters. We have some obviously historical writing from Tacitus and Cassius Dio. But at the same time, the urban courts are not sort of specifically mentioned in most sources. You either get implications, you get a couple of very specific references. But most of our literary sources are very much pieced together. And obviously most of it's by inference. And for the urban courts, we also have epigraphy, as I mentioned. These are the inscriptions. We have a lot of those. Uh, the last person who wrote on my topic before I did uh, was a German scholar, uh, Helmut Freis, in 1967, and an American scholar who got his doctorate as a philologist in 1968, if memory serves, um, Fred Mensch. Uh, these are the last two men who actually ever wrote on the urban courts before I did it in uh, 2004-2007. So even, even in that sort of short span of time, you'd think, from 1966, oh, sorry, 1967, 1968 to uh, 2004, you wouldn't think we'd find more things. Well, maybe most people wouldn't think so, but I'm sure some of my Palmyra's colleagues would realize that we find a lot of stuff every year. Um, even if it's only one inscription, two inscriptions, over 40 years that builds up. And I found doing a literature review that actually I found something like an extra 200 inscriptions, I think, over that 40 year period. And some of them actually allowed us to make different interpretations. And in some cases, I offered up a different uh, analysis. And this talk sort of is born out of that analysis and me essentially not quite debunking, but with better evidence and more evidence, maybe disproving earlier arguments from a previous generation of scholarship. Now, in addition to this, uh, we have for the Roman army in general, we also have other things. We have um, coins actually, numismatics. Now we don't get the Praetorian courts Oh, sorry, the urban courts specifically on coins, but we do see the army in general in coinage all the way up to the end of the empire. Uh, we see it even, well, even under a Christian emperor like Constantine the Great, we still see images of um, Sol Invictus, for example, the favored god of the army in the fourth century CE. We have several coins from Claudius and Nero's reigns, literally on the reverse of the coin with um, the emperor hand posed like this, literally addressing the soldiers, and it literally says, ad ocutio cohortes, addressing the troops. So these are some of the sources we have. Now, the tricky thing with doing a unit history, as I was doing, was that funerary inscriptions are not, uh, how should I put this, to the regular person, super sexy. They're extremely formulaic. Roman inscriptions in general are extremely formulaic. In so many cases, they're so formulaic that we actually have abbreviations, so that um, apparently they were that formulaic even to the Roman at that time. So for example, we see things like Dismanibus to the spirits of the dead, uh, Benimerenti to most deserving or well-deserved 
we see these things, you know, abbreviated in the case of DM as Dismondibus, shortened to DM. We actually see a special um, sign, kind of looks like a number seven almost. And if you see that, it's usually a military inscription because it is used to represent a century. And then we have uh, BM for, well, not the British Museum, but a Ben Morenti. We have Hic Citus S, HSE. So these are extremely formulaic. So even if your Latin is not superb, once you get the hang of this, you can pretty much sort of guess the meaning even if you don't know the full Latin. And as I said, given that the literary sources are very sparse on mentions of the military, yes, you're going to say, oh, but someone describes the army. They're fighting civil wars. Like, well, yes, they are. But we don't know which units. We don't know how many soldiers generally. Even the numbers we do have are somewhat suspect, if only because of ancient sources' um, predisposition towards, well, inflating numbers. So these are some of the many tools that we as historians use to try and figure this out. So as speaking about our friend, um, this is one of them right now. This is Caius Menea Secundus. As you can see from the uh, inscription, this is from the Capitoline Museum when I was last there in 2008. Um, this is a soldier who is being commemorated by his brother, actually. Um, now, what's really cool about this is that up there, this has been painted in antiquity. So you see the little figure of uh, Caius Menea Secundus, who tells us that he's um, a soldier of the 14th Urban Cohort. And what's really cool is you see the abbreviations I'm giving you there. Like, uh, for example, K, the C, is Caius, or sometimes rendered as Gaius, a G. Um, so you can see their DM. But again, this gives you the sense of the formulaic nature of this. So here, we don't get a huge amount of information in that sense of like, when did this guy enlist? When did this guy do this? How did he die? We don't necessarily get that information, but we do get a lot of other information. We get, in some cases, uh, name, tribe. We also, if we know where this was found, we can track down um, via material culture and other inscriptions. Was that name, that family name, common in the area? Is he someone who's likely to have come there, or is this something where the guy joined the army, retired, and moved out here? So we actually get a sense of, when you have enough of these things, the origins of the soldier, perhaps, uh, likelihood of socioeconomic status, how he wanted to be remembered, who was commemorating him or remembering him. In this case, uh, Lucius Menunius, uh, Menenius Secundus, his actual literal brother. But in other cases, we get really cool things where we get soldiers commemorating someone who has a completely different name, but they refer to themselves as frater, brother, or the best of comrades in some cases. And it gives you, again, a sense of humanity here, that these are men who are commemorating each other and if they had no other family left, they were each other's family. So it gives us, again, that whole big picture. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, most of us, I think, we know the Praetorian Guard. And I came to this conversation actually wanting to do my doctoral thesis on the Praetorian Guard. Uh, my doctoral supervisor at Royal Holloway was uh, Professor Boris Rankov, and he is sort of well known as the Praetorian Guard expert amongst, I think, only two or three. I think there might be one other person uh, in the UK who's published in academia on the Praetorian Guard. I think that's Sandra Bingham up at Edinburgh. Other than that, um, these are the only few people who are really that interested in most of the material, again, is epigraphic. So where does this come in? Well, not only do we know the Praetorian Guard because they are the sexy unit, uh, they are the Imperial Bodyguard by sort of by default. Uh, they're the only troops that are allowed in Italy in the early empire. It's a very anomalous situation. And when they're in the city, Originally, Augustus only has three cohorts out of nine protecting him at a time. And even then, those three cohorts are in civilian garb, essentially. They're wearing togas. They have weapons, but you are not allowed to see them. I mean, you might hear a clanking sound coming from someone wearing a toga who's acting just like a regular civilian. You might see these guys hanging around the Senate um, who shouldn't otherwise be there, but, you know, you don't ask questions in, in that sort of period. And the Praetorian Guard are fascinating because, well, they have access to power. They literally protect the emperor's life. In some cases, they take the emperor's life, uh, depending on how unlucky that emperor is. And they're some of the most thing, fascinating things because they capture the people's imagination. And yet they're pretty humble origins. They have Republican origins, uh, little R Republican from the Roman Republic. And they originated in small units of 
friends escorting a governor out to his province or handpicked soldiers. They're meant to protect him on his journey. They're meant to protect him uh, in combat. And slowly over time, this evolves into a more formalized unit. These have become picked troops by the civil wars of the late Republic, as you as note there. Each warlord, each military strongman seems to have his own Praetorian cohort. Now, when Caesar dies, his successors like Mark Antony and Octavian actually split up his Praetorians and take them as part of their legitimacy. Like, these are Caesar's troops. I am Caesar's heir. In Mark Antony's case, or politically, and in Octavian's case, uh, politically and family-wise, he is also Julius Caesar's heir. And when the two actually duke it out and Mark Antony, as we know, lost Rome's civil wars finally end after, you know, a century of off and on civil war from Marius and Sulla all the way to the Second Triumvirate. And something like 60 years out of 100 are basically spent periodically fighting other Romans. As part of the club PR, Octavian reunites his Praetorians and Mark Antony's Praetorians and basically tells the Roman world, just as the army is reunited, the whole Roman world is united and reunited back into being Rome. It's longer us versus us, but us versus them and who them is will leave to essentially me, the emperor or the future emperor. Now these early Praetorians are fascinating because eventually they are placed in 2 BCE under the command of two equestrian prefects who outrank all the equestrian tribunes. Uh, these Praetorian prefects then exercise overall command of the guard for the emperor. And it's very clear why this is done. The emperor, for example, Augustus, is not stupid. When he becomes Augustus, shifting from Octavian to Augustus, he realizes several things. The Romans will never put up with a monarchy, ask Caesar what happened when people thought he was trying to be monarch. And then here's Augustus, who really is monarch, but doesn't take the title of Rex. There is no title for emperor here either, yet. He's simply first citizen. And we have this fictional restoration of the Republic. Now, at the same time, it's very clear that Augustus is what we might term a military dictator. And he's a very clever PR man. He's very clever politically. He is um, beyond belief in one sense as um, Roman super patron. There's a client-patron relationship. And he owns the army, essentially. He's given them retirement benefits. He's given them rewards, donatives. They love him. And yet, the reason why he puts not a senator in command, but to a question Praetorian prefects is partially checks and balances. Uh, the only person of equal rank to the emperor would be another senator, putting the imperial bodyguard who's responsible for the health and safety of the emperor under the command of a potential rival is a no-no. And as we later see throughout the history of the empire, equestrian Praetorian prefects who try and take power for themselves, like Sejanus or Macrinus, they end up really poorly. And by poorly, I mean dead. The Senate does not respect them and they will not give them the time of day. In fact, Macrinus is so humiliated by the Senate that eventually he, he's murdered by his own troops. So there is a clear political reason for this. Now these individual cohorts, of uh, which point they're nine, they're only ever allowed to be in the capital three at a time. The rest are stationed outside the city. Uh, the ones in the city of Rome, they're actually not built in a barracks. They're built it in people's homes. Uh, if you think about the history of the American Constitution, we have the amendment, I forget which one it is exactly, is it the third? But we're not required, we're not allowed to um, billet troops in people's homes, quartering troops. You can imagine that's not a problem for the Romans. And at the same time, you can imagine it causes friction. But that's for another talk. Now, the whole thing I'm trying to make a point of here is that this stuff doesn't happen overnight. Augustus creating all this military reform, Augustus creating all of this stuff is the culmination of decades of maneuvering as Octavian and decades of maneuvering as Augustus, the, you know, the elder statesman, the senior political leader, the military dictator, whatever you want to call them. Now, where does this all come in? Well, here's a brief timeline of what we know. By 2 BC, we know there's the creation of the Praetorian prefects. Around 13 or 14 CE, we have the creation of Augustus' will. And this is the first mention we have in the literary text from Suetonius specifically, and I'll give you the literary um, text and translations later, of Augustus actually mentioning anything about these urban cohorts. In fact, of any Roman source mentioning specifically urban cohorts. And then by 312 CE, we have the timeline of 
the Battle of Milvian Bridge, Constantine the First defeats the Emperor Maxentius, who was also his brother-in-law and rival for the throne. And we presume that the urban cohorts and Praetorian Guard who backed Maxentius are defeated. Uh, we certainly know the Praetorian Guard are defeated because most of them drowned in the river, in the retreat. So that's sort of the rough timeline of the urban cohorts and what's happening. Now, we're going to go through a bit here of the sources first. I know it seems roundabout. But we'll go through the sources first, then I'll give you the full argument. So we have in the Latin, um, <clears throat> the cohortibus urbanus quinginos. Now this is just literally a listing of how much money the emperor is giving to the army, essentially. So he's left the Roman people 40 million sesterces, to the tribes 3,500,000, uh, 3, to the soldier of the Praetorian Guard, 1,000 each. Uh, it's a pretty substantial chunk of change. And to the city cohorts, literally the urban cohorts, 500, to the legionaries, 300. So here, we actually get a sense here of scale. Uh, if it helps, and if you know anything about the Roman army, uh, there are four sesterces to the denarius. The average legionary makes about 220 of denarii a year in the early empire. So imagine as a donative upon the death of Augustus, basically thanking his legionaries, here's a third of your annual pay for free, just because you're, you're soldiers and because I died. Enjoy. So if you can imagine, uh, the urban cohorts are not as well paid as the Praetorian Guard, but clearly extremely well paid. Uh, we think that the Praetorians are probably making 750 denarii a year. The urban cohorts, you know, a little bit less, obviously, um, 375, but still far more than the legionaries. So that's the earliest point in which we can see the creation of an urban cohort. Okay, great. So there's a problem. Now, what is the problem? Well, first off, as I said, we'll present all the evidence first and we'll go back and backtrack. We have Tacitus writing, um, well, a little bit after Augustus' reign, because he's writing in the reign of Domitian and Trajan. Uh, Tacitus writes, Though in any case the capital possessed a standing army of its own, three urban and nine Praetorian cohorts recruiting in the, recruited in the main from Etruria and Umbria or Old Latium and the earlier Roman colonies. So from other literary sources, we now get a number of cohorts. So it looks like we have three urban and nine Praetorian cohorts. Okay, fantastic. That's really easy. In fact, we see from the epigraphy, those numbers seem to hold up for quite some time uh, off and on. And we now know where they're recruited from. Excellent. Well, this is what's being told by Tacitus in the mid sort of first century, late first century. This is great because when we look at epigraphy, like I mentioned, we can actually track down in many cases uh, based upon names or in many cases soldiers actually tell you their hometown on their tombstone as well as their voting tribe, which again allows us to pinpoint, well, where are these guys from? And uh, if you ever are bored enough to read my doctoral thesis, we can request it from Royal Holloway or the British Library or Senate House Institute of Classical Studies Library in London. You'll actually see in one of my chapters, we actually talk about recruitment. And that chapter actually shows that the urban cohorts, for the most part, recruit something like 88 to 90% of the recruits from Italy or the areas immediately around Italy. We don't get any sort of major uh, sources from Spain, Gaul, we get one or two maybe, but the majority of recruits come from Italy, as Tacitus tells us. So again, this is good. And finally, we have this. Now, this is uh, my translation of inscription that you can find in uh, Letters, 1978 article from Athenaeum. And it's a pretty straightforward inscription. To Aulus Virgius Marcus, son of Lucius, Primus Pilus for the second time of the Third Gallic Legion, Prefect of the Egyptian camp, a Prefect of Engineers, Military Tribute in the Praetorium of the Deified Augustus and Tiberius Caesar Augustus of the 11th and 4th Praetorian Cohorts, member of the Board of Four for five years, honor on his death by the town councillors and people in the colony of Choadensium Augusta and Maruvium. In his will, he gave to the village of Aninus five silver statues or images of, August, of Caesar and 10,000 sesterces to reward the village of Aninus. So this guy, he's a pretty senior officer. He's done quite well. And he's given a huge, huge donative to uh, two local towns. I'm oh, sorry, to one local town. And he's being honored by two local places. Now, what's interesting about this is we get some anomalies. 
now we'll come back to this so don't worry about this too much right now and i'll come back to it but let's go all the way back to well, okay but how are they created well, the challenge of this topic is that it's a very important topic and i'm not saying that just because i'm like the world's living expert on the topic i think the other two men have either passed away or long retired um but i say this because it is an important topic since it's part of the political history of the early roman empire now we have no references to the creation we have augustus will from suetonius telling us that they have been created by that point but we don't know exactly when and we don't know uh, how people exactly reacted we don't have a lot so our epigraphic sources essentially are our key ways of understanding the material and finding this answer. And like I mentioned, in particular, we're going to focus on all this Virgis Marcus career and how that sheds light on the creation of the urban cohorts. Now, first, as we saw in Tacitus, that's our first mention of the numbers. We have three of them. In fact, if we look at inscriptions, generally speaking, for the period, we see the numbers. Uh, we have nine Praetorian cohorts and we have three urban cohorts. I'm going to pause here, but if we have three urban cohorts, which numbers do you think they would have? I'm going to call on someone like I do in my class um, for my amusement usually, not for theirs. It's usually to their mortification. But Katie, if I'm creating a military unit with three urban cohorts, literally there are three of them, what would I number them? What do you think? Would it be one, two, and possibly three? That would make sense. If we look at the nine Praetorian cohorts, guess what they're no numbered as? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's not what happens with the urban courts. We get 10, 11, 12. Anyone think this is strange? If you do, great. If you don't, hang on. Or as my students say, buckle your seatbelt. Uh, we do get a potential early creation of the urban cohorts. Uh, previous scholarship like uh, Edward Eccles, for example, in 1950 suggests that actually we have cohorts far earlier. Uh, perhaps as early as 16 BC, we have the creation of the urban cohorts. This might be a little bit far-fetched, especially since at that point in time, Augustus has no reason to create any of these urban cohorts. He already has Praetorians. He already limits the number of Praetorians that are in there. So it's possible that we could have an early creation. We have Augustus actually trying to recreate the urban prefecture. Uh, this is a very senior senatorial post. In fact, it is the senior senator in the entire Roman world after the emperor. The only way for an urban prefect to go any higher is to be the emperor. And that does actually happen. Uh, there's a man named Pertinax, who in 193 CE becomes emperor. He's uh, the son of an, an ex-slave. He becomes a school teacher, decides it doesn't pay well, joins the army. Marcus Aurelius raises him to the Senate, makes him a general. And when Commodus is murdered, um, thank God, because Commodus was an idiot, the Senate, all these blue blood aristocrats, turn to Pertinax and go, you're the guy. You're the best of us. You should be emperor. And so, Imagine, to be urban prefect is a very senior position by that point in the empire. When Augustus comes to the throne, he actually he has to create the office. So none of this stuff exists. And imagine Augustus is creating stuff over his 41 year reign. He's very carefully sneaking things in to maintain the facade of a restoration of the Republic, even as in reality we have the Roman Empire, as we historians call it. Um, for the Roman world, there is no Roman Empire. It's just simply the Roman Republic. We just happen to have some guy who sometimes wears a crown when it's acceptable. I'm being a bit facetious, but we literally see on our coins the Romans still using uh, Rei Publica, for example, or Res Publica, the Republic. So <clears throat> the sham at least makes sense and works. Now, why do we even have soldiers in the city? Well, as I mentioned, for Augustus, the Praetorian Guard exists to protect him. And also as a subtle reminder to any opponents within Italy that the army may be on the frontiers, 28 legions, 150,000 men roughly, and 150,000 non-citizen troops, the auxiliaries. They may all be on the frontier, but if you piss me off, there are a bunch of people here at Rome who can quietly make you disappear if I need to. Now, Augustus generally doesn't need to do this. The threat's enough. Uh, in fact, Augustus even doesn't even need to make that threat. Uh, we actually know that he can kill people's political careers just by, well, supporting the other person's rival. Augustus is pretty influential. He ends the civil wars. He has so much authority, if you will, personal authority. That's a very personal quality. 
people remember him for saving the day and ending the civil wars. So if Augustus has to carefully and slowly do this, it means that he recognizes the challenges of creating a monarchy and having an imperial bodyguard is too obvious a thing. Hence why two thirds of the cohorts stay outside and the three inside the city wear civilian garb all the time. Now, I don't know if any of you have been to Rome before in the summer, but even by this point in Roman history, most people have given up wearing the toga, except for very formal occasions. So you can imagine a hot summer day in Rome, wearing a tunic, and having a wool toga wrapped around you on a typical August day, or July day, or June day in, in Rome. Um, people start to wonder, like, that's hot, why are you doing this? It's like, oh no, I'm average Joe six-pack, just regular guy, who's, you know, essentially got the Roman equivalent of a buzz cut, is very chiseled, uh, the right military height, and makes a faint clanking sound, right where maybe you'd have a dagger or a sword. So Augustus does all this because he wants the facade of a republic. He wants this. And yet at the same time, Augustus is creating a monarchy, a monarchy where you cannot officially have a monarchy. And yet we clearly are a monarchy with a crown prince who cannot be actually de jure crown prince, even though we're de facto crown prince. So one reason I argue that uh, A, for the creation of the urban cohorts, basically near Augustus' death, is, well, because of that inscription I showed you of Aulus Virginius Marcus, and also because of the challenge politically of Augustus trying to figure out who the hell is going to come after me when I die. Now, we're not going into the genealogy of everyone who tries to follow. Spoilers, most of his chosen heirs die of natural or mysterious causes. Um, I leave you to that one. Uh, it's a very fun one. One of the heirs does die under much less mysterious circumstances. In, in 14 CE, uh, the posthumous son of Augustus' daughter Julia and his best friend Agrippa, a man named Agrippa Posthumus, is murdered by troops in exile. Now, Tacitus actually blames Tiberius for that. I and a number of other scholars actually argue Augustus probably ordered his own grandson's execution. I know it sounds cold-blooded, but bear with me. It all makes sense because it's about ensuring a stable succession, preventing civil war, because we don't want that again. Augustus does not spend 41 years creating a monarchy and neutering the Senate. And basically, well, not brainwashing, but convincing people it's in their best interests to not think too deeply about a restoration of the Republic for him to not plan for the succession. Now, what's really cool about this is that, as I said, we have the inscriptions. Now, Aulus Fergus Marsus is fascinating because the fact that he serves as Praetorian Tribune over two cohorts, and it seems like under two emperors. So he had a very good career. And a military tribune in the Praetorian cohorts, this is the pinnacle of a military career. These are usually men who have been um, centurions, who then make what we call primus pulis, first spear, the chief centurion of a legion. There are only 28 of them. And these men often, the most promising of them, go on to command the three Rome garrison units, so a tribunate of the firemen slash police, quote unquote, the Wigiles, Vigiles. Um, and then afterwards, usually a tribunate for one year of the urban cohorts, and then you culminate with a tribunate in the Praetorian cohorts. And men after that, obviously as a military tribune, you've achieved a question rank, you're now a lower tier aristocrat. And after that, you end up as probably an equestrian governor of a province, you might have other further military adventures, but this is the pinnacle of a military career if you're an equestrian. And the only way you can go higher there is perhaps to end up as prefect of Egypt in a equestrian position as governor of Egypt or one of the two Praetorian prefects. So Aulus Fergus Mars says, um, well, Lucius, his father, hopefully is proud because this guy did well. Sorry, it says Marcus, there should be Marsus. Um, my apologies for the typo. Um, but we see here that he tells us, and this is where Katie goes, hang on, this is weird. But Dr. Mike, didn't you just say in Tassus there are 11, you know, nine Praetorian cohorts and three urban cohorts? What the hell is cohort 11? How does this happen? Now, this one this was published uh, in 1970 by Letta. This is a strange thing. I mean, it's not unusual for a military officer to record the pinnacle of their career, but how do we explain the contradiction here between Tassus, who's arguing for the year 23 CE, there are only 12 cohorts total, nine Praetorian, three urban. What's going on here? Now, Letta argues, for example, that, well, 
this is not a problem. We know that later on, uh, there are more Praetorian cohorts. Uh, by the time we get to the civil wars of 69 CE, the year of the four emperors, we have something ludicrous like 16 Praetorian cohorts. And we later see them expanded beyond that. So let's just suggest that whatever happened, there must have been more than nine Praetorian cohorts. Okay, fair enough. I don't think that's a problem. The only problem is that Leta argues this obviously happens much sooner. So why is this important? Well, part of the argument I'm making is that this is wrong. Now, uh, two scholars, Brian Dobson and Letta, they argue that if inscription contains errors, the reason why there's something weird is going on is that probably in Augustus reign, there are only nine cohorts or something's going on. Someone screwed up, someone screwed the pooch somewhere and that the 11th and 4th are actually out of sequence. Now, what this means is that Osbergus Marcus was served in the fourth Praetorian cohort under Augustus and an eleventh cohort under Tiberius. Uh, okay, fine. Dobson also agrees. Uh, unit order is not consistent. Uh, they actually argue based on another soldier who actually, funny enough, actually also serves as uh, an officer in the Praetorian Guard and the Urban cohorts. A man named Caius Oppius. Uh, Bassus, where the units, so the career is also out of sequence, and that's fine, but generally the units are not out of sequence. So my argument is that this seems like an unnecessary assumption that the lapis eye, the stone carver, basically, you know, screwed it up. That if we just take the implication of the inscription that actually this is the order that was intended, well, this changes the case. And a number of scholars like Lawrence Kepi, uh, Boris Rankov, and myself do not think this is out of sequence. So this is actually quite deliberate and makes sense. And it helps, it helps us understand why there is a cohort, uh, undecima, an 11th cohort, and why later on we have an 11th urban cohort. <clears throat> now, what probably happens is, as Kepi argues, and I would agree, that under Augustus, Marcus was tribune of the 11th cohort, which then became the 11th urban cohort. And he then serves for the remainder of his career as tribune of the fourth Praetorian cohort under Tiberius. That would seem to make more logical sense. That would seem to fit the inscriptions we have already. And if we accept this argument, then we have no earlier creation of like a 16 BCE. We have probably around this period uh, to go with the will, at least 13 CE, which is what Suetonius tells us the will was written in. Now, if we accept all of this, then this really neatly makes sense. Now, again, if we presume that Marcus actually means that he's tribune of the 11th Praetorian cohort, and then is promoted to, well, not promoted to, promoted sideways, essentially, to the uh, 4th Praetorian cohort, why do this? Why does Augustus do this? Why create an extra military unit? Well, before we go on, let's remember, Augustus spends 41 years creating essentially a monarchy backed by the military. And upon his death, because by this point, Augustus has seen his two grandsons slash adopted sons, Gaius and Lucius, they've died. Tiberius' brother, whom Augustus loved, and was also a potential heir, has died. Agrippa Posthumus, his character is not suited to rule. He's been put into exile. Um, Augustus' daughter, Julia, will not be producing any more heirs because, well, she slept with too many of the wrong men, and she also is exiled. And by this point, basically, all that's left is Tiberius. I know that sounds really harsh on Tiberius. Uh, he's not quite as bad an emperor as he's made out to be. He certainly um, has issues, but as an administrator, he's actually reasonably competent. <clears throat> Imagine by Augustus' end of his life, he's like, great, this, as, my, um, as my Chinese ancestors would say, like my, my great-grandfather used to say, this is my great-grandmother. But you'd get things like, you know, it's, it's literally Luo Dai Chang, uh, which is Cantonese for, these are the oranges at the bottom of the basket. Or as you might put it, the dregs. Like, great, I've got Tiberius, bugger. All right, well, you know, this is what we've got. Let's make use of it. Augustus is planning for the succession of his stepson, who will later become his adopted son. 
but at the same time, Augustus also is like, well, will this work? We've never done a succession before. We haven't done a succession like this in, well, 500 years since we overthrew the monarchy in 509 uh, BCE. So how do we make this happen? Now, Augustus tries very hard to create a successor. When he did have other choices, he got them ingratiated into the Senate. For example, if you ever look at a coin of the Emperor Augustus, there's one, one of my favorites. I used to have an example, but uh, I think it fell in my bag and I've lost it. But it's a beautiful denarius where it has Augustus on the obverse, and on the reverse it has his two adopted sons, Gaius and Lucius, and they're called Princapes Juventes, the leaders of the youth, because guess who's Princap Senatus, leader of the Senate? Augustus, their adopted father. So there's this implied hint, just as I am the leaders of the fathers of the city, my sons are leaders of the sons of the city. And when we, gentlemen, pass on, hint, 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 something else will happen. Hint, hint, hint. I mean, it's, it's subtle, but not that subtle. Um, <clears throat> but these are very informal mechanisms. And again, the things that make Augustus emperor in all but name, the things that make him powerful, even his own name, Imperator Caesar Augustus, or rather Imperator Caesar Dewey Filio Augustus, it's, it's a title, not a name, but it becomes a name. Imperator, essentially conquering general. Caesar, well, because he's Julius Caesar's adopted son, who is Dewey Filio, the son of the deified one, because Octavian had Julius Caesar made into a god by the Senate. Augustus, the sacred one, the revered one. So if we ever think about the power, the propaganda that's being built into Augustus' name, we're thinking about his military power, we're thinking about his monopoly of the political system, essentially. We see a guy who looks like he has all the power, but this is very personal. He can't transfer this loyalty to someone else. So whenever he tries to create a successor, he involves him in government. He goes, look, these guys are working with me. Share with them your knowledge, fellow senators. Advise them as you've advised me. At the same time, he's making a point. These are my successors, whether it's legal or not. They're going to take over. This is all about making sure there is a succession. This is about making sure that there is not a repeat of the civil wars. This is all about stability. And so when Tiberius is preparing to send the throne, Augustus is trying to figure out, how do I do this and make sure that there is no potential for a revolt, that the Senate doesn't try anything stupid, especially since I've made it a habit to have only three cohorts in the city. In a city of several hundred thousand, like Rome, and imagine upon Augustus' death and the accession of a new emperor, tourists will be flocking in. Three, you know, three courts may not be enough to sort of assert the power of the emperor or the new emperor. So we get Augustus actually trying to recreate the Praetorian prefecture, uh, urban prefecture, sorry. And the urban prefecture was an ancient office, uh, usually held by, by senior senators. And over time, the office faded away. It's very coincidental that Augustus revives it around this time period. His first attempt in the 20s BCE don't work, uh, partly because his first urban prefect surrenders the office, I think, in six days and says, this is too much power for me. I don't want this. And it's not that the guy, uh, Masala Corvinus, doesn't want the power or is an enemy of Augustus. He's the guy who actually proposes Augustus in 27 BCE, gets the new name Augustus. He is one of Augustus' guys. And what he's saying there is that the world is not yet ready for too obvious a sign of monarchy. So let's pull back a bit. Now, sometime around Augustus' death, he creates the office again. And for whatever reason, this time the office sticks, possibly because he's had 40-some years to basically manipulate the political system. Now, in addition to this, we then see, all of a sudden, the three urban cohorts. Now, to go back to this, if you're going, well, Dr. Ng, why are you, why are you suggesting 10, 11, 12 makes sense? Well, here's why. Because even when the Praetorian courts eventually go to 16 or go to 12 or go to whatever number they go to, the Praetorian courts may fluctuate. But the urban courts, funny enough, never fluctuate in numbers. We have one weird change, a first urban cohort, and that's more of a weird uh, Flavian dynasty decision. But when we get something like six eventually urban cohorts, we get numbers like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. They are never numbered any less than 10 except for the one anomaly. Which is why I argue that Kepi, Rankov, and myself are right. 
the epigraphy fits, and um, it's the only thing that makes sense. But even after we have Lipertorians going to, to 10 cohorts, for example, there's still a 10th urban cohort sharing the garrison with them. And the only reason that would have happened is if Augustus had taken three former Praetorian cohorts and simply renamed them urban. Now, again, why is this all important? Because when Augustus does die, the first urban prefect, uh, a man named Lucius Caparus Piso, he's actually Tiberius' drinking buddy. He is a trusted member of the imperial family, essentially, who is very likely throwing his weight to the new emperor, even though he's a senator. And again, if we have six cohorts now in the city, because it's not my unit, it's not the emperor's bodyguard, this is the senate's army. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I mean, you can't see me winking, but you know, you take my point. If we think of that, then this is why Augustus creates them and why he creates them, why they reappear around this time period. This is Augustus making sure that his stepson has the best run up to hold the office, to hold the emperorship and survive. And it's all the more pressing because pretty soon after uh, Tiberius takes the throne, we have two mutinies of the army. So imagine this is all with Augustus' precautions. Without the precautions of the urban court's creation, it could have been worse, especially at Rome. Right, uh, and that is it. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. You see how we've linked the evidence together with inscriptions backing up the very uh, sparse literary evidence. I'm happy to answer questions, but um, hopefully you enjoy that and maybe one day you'll see this in print. Okay. Uh, any questions, comments? Booing? No questions, but thank you. That was very interesting. Oh, no worries, Kit. Thank you very much. <laughs> totally agree. Very interesting. So this is your chance, folks. If there's comments, you've got them right oh. there in your screen, and you can ask them what you need to. Okay. Yep, I see Scott's comments. You're very welcome, Scott. Well, Michael, if, if no one else has got questions, I just want to say thank you very much <clears throat> for your presentation this evening. Oh, not a problem. I really enjoyed it. So I haven't talked about the urban coats in a while. So, well, that's not true. I talk about them sort of every year at the dig, but, you know, not to a general audience. Um, I don't get to give as many uh, presentations as I used to. So, and with COVID, I'm not sure I'm going to be giving you presentations in person for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to fingers crossed that we're going to be done with this soon. Yeah, I hope so. Oh, God, I hope so. <laughs> okay, well, folks, I want to say thank you for joining us tonight. And again, if this format is of interest to you, I'll send out an email letting you know about the presentation in August on the 9th um, with uh, um, Jonathan Cleary, JQ. And uh, really appreciate you guys joining us. Have a great evening and have a great July. Thanks so much. Take care, folks. Good night. Good night. <laughs>